to Bad Book Club. Thank you so much for your patience with me a couple weeks ago when I reposted Twilight. Um, it was just kind of a crazy month. It snuck up on me and I didn't really have time to do anything. <laughs> I was ready for Bad Book Club, but I kind of wasn't because all of my plans got waylaid. There was the snowpocalypse. There was just a lot of stuff that happen happened. And so it just made sense for me to repost something and kind of save my material until a little bit later. Um, but I do have really some exciting stuff going on with the podcast this season, and I'm super excited to share it with you. So I don't know. I'm going to save that for later. I'm not going to do too many announcements on this podcast episode. But for today, I thought we would do something kind of quirky. So last season, I had an episode that was on a poem, and I really enjoyed doing that. So I thought that this time... I would do it again. I love talking about poems, especially in like a science fiction and fantasy context because there are so many and also not that many to choose from. It's kind of a weird dichotomy, but it's fine. Anyway, I thought that on this episode, we would talk about The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. I would bet that you know that poem, even if you don't know you know it. <laughs> it's very pervasive in like culture and social media like my husband has a shirt that has just like a picture of a raven on it and that's from the raven by edgar Allan poe there's just so much that happens in it so i thought we'd go through it and talk about it and science fiction a little and what it actually means because i think a lot of people listen or read that podcast podcast that poem <laughs> and then they are you know confused by it and because it's kind of a weird one and it's also kind of long so in lieu of a summary, I thought I would just read it to you and then we could talk about it. And then I have some super exciting stuff coming up for the podcast this season. I'm really excited and I'll talk about that at the end. So should we just jump in? Wait, no, not yet. I want to tell you a little bit more about Edgar Allan Poe. So let's see, Edgar Allan Poe. So some weird facts about Edgar Allan Poe. So a lot of people think of him as like this like womanizing madman who like drunk himself to death and stuff like that. Um, I'm told and I've read and I've studied that that's actually somewhat inaccurate. Like uh, what happened was is after Poe died, a rival wrote his obituary and he was like really rude to Edgar Allan Poe because they were rivals. So he said all this crazy stuff about him and Edgar Allan Poe's friends were like, no, that's not Edgar Allan Poe. Like, yes, he was a starving artist and yeah, he drank sometimes, but like, He's not like a weird, horrible guy, but that like weird, crazy reputation kind of stuck with him and now he's kind of stuck with it. Um, everyone thinks he's just as weird as his writing. And really he was kind of a normal dude. He did have kind of a strange life, but what can you do? His parents were actors and he was orphaned, which is a big bummer. But he was also like a professional writer. He was one of the first ones, which is actually like really cool that he was able to do that. I mean, like barely able. Starving artist is pretty accurate. <laughs> Writers were not paid a lot back in the day. Yeah, also fun facts. He was the creator, you know, like believed to be creator. When it comes to literary stuff, there's never really like strict answers for things, but believed to be the creator of the detective story and of like popularizing short fiction, like short stories. He was a big part of that and he wrote a ton. He was considered to be like a prodigy because he wrote so much when he was younger, he was just, he was a huge deal, you know? He was, he was a trailblazer. He did everything different. And he did it all during like a time where people weren't really doing that. So he responded. So we've talked about this before in the podcast because I'm a nerd, but <laughs> Poe is very gothic and gothic is a part of romanticism. Romanticism was in response to the enlightenment. So during this time, a lot of people wrote a lot of science-y, like official science-y things or like romanticism also had this other sect that was called like realism and naturalism. And what that was, was it all about the beauty of nature. And if you're not one for imagery or description, then you're not gonna like it. <laughs> Think like <laughs> Rip Van Winkle or like, which is just about him falling asleep on a mountain for like years, years and years, like a hundred years or something crazy. So. It's just one of those things where realism and naturalism were really ongoing. They were kind of boring. They were about nature and it was very, very realistic. It was like, can you paint but with words? That's kind of what it was. Um, and Poe went the opposite direction. He, he dove deeper into the Gothic, deeper into the supernatural. He got really into like 
what it meant, you know, and like death and the unknown. He had a lot to say about it. And that's kind of what he was about, you know? And so, yeah, that's kind of all my Poe facts. Oh, other than uh, that he died super mysteriously. They're not quite sure how he died. Oh, and I have another weird one after this. Um, they're not quite sure how he died. So he like, he like went missing for like five days. And then he turned up at like a rehab center and, and he just died. And they're like, I don't know what happened to this guy. And it was diagnosed, I think is like brain something like brain contusions or brain fog. Like he literally died from brain fog. And nowadays people have no idea how it happened. They wonder if it was like rabies or if he was a, like murdered and poisoned or something. Like no one knows. His death is as mysterious as his stories are, which is super weird. And another super strange thing that he did that I remember hearing about back in the day was that he married his cousin, which was like not a super huge deal back then, but she was a teenager. She was like 13. <laughs> she was really young. It was kind of, kind of gross. It wasn't the best, but anyway, <laughs> those are my, those are my Poe facts. Poe was a weird guy, but he's not as weird as you think he is. Um, and with that nice disclaimer, we should just jump in to the poem. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of some one gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my book's surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This is it, and nothing more." Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. "'Sir,' said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before, but the silence was unbroken, and stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore? Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice, let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mine of lord or lady, Perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is, on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly. 
though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast above the sculptured bust above his chamber door. With such name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of the bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er? She shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed by an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, Thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and repent, nen pent, from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nen nepenth, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether temptest tossed thee here ashore, Desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest of the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of thy lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming show, throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. So I had a couple stutters. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. This was written like a million years ago and I was trying not to speak too slowly. There was a word in there that I forgot. I realized I had never said out loud before, which happens to me pretty frequently. Um, I was like, dang it, I've said that in my brain, but now I doubt myself <laughs> how it's pronounced, but I think it's all right. Anywho, isn't that such an interesting poem? First of all, it's way longer than I like remember it being. I read this poem um, in college not too long ago, but I don't remember it being this long. And also I have more vivid memories of Poe's other stories that I read when I was younger. So 
I absolutely hate the Telltale Heart because I'm not a horror person and Poe is all about the horror and the Telltale Heart is so scary. I don't like it. It's very spooky. If you've never read a short story and you want to be terrified that someone's gonna murder you in the nighttime and then hide your body underneath some wooden floors, then go ahead. It's amazing <laughs> if that's what you're into. But if you're not into that, I don't recommend it. <laughs> it was not for me. <laughs> um, I also hated, what's it called? The cask of vanilla. You guys know what I'm talking about. You're experts, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I feel like Amontillado or something. Look, I'm an English major, but like I said, horror is not my thing. Poe is not usually my thing. Um, so whatever, I read that a really long time ago and that one is also very scary and it very much stuck with me. I was like, nope, I'm not a Poe fan, but I like the Raven. I like the Raven because I'm a sucker for, for anything poetic. And also I kind of like old tiny rhymes like that. So if any of you follow poetry at the moment, Poetry right now is really big in like free verse and blank verse, which means there's not usually a rhyme to it. It's very free form. Sometimes there's rhythm, sometimes it's prose. It's not even like rhyming at all. I would say that this very like classic rhyme and also like the two couplets that it usually ends with. So like poetic terms, a couplet is like two lines that rhyme usually. So for example, a sonnet is 14 lines and then it ends with a couplet always. And a sonnet is A, B, A, B. So this is, this is something I bet is difficult to explain. I just didn't think it through. So a sonnet, for example, has A, B rhyme scheme, which means that like the first sentence ends with no, the second sentence is a B rhyme scheme. So it ends with yes. And then the third sentence is though, and the fourth sentence is bless. Do you see that? A, B, A, B. So that's usually a sonnet. And then usually it ends in a couplet. So it's like A, A at the very end. So this, The Raven by Poe is one, two, three. Let's count. You can hear me count. I know that's so wonderful to hear. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on a podcast. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 stanzas. I'm sorry I didn't think about <laughs> counting them before. It's 18 stanzas. And they end with like a couplet and then they end with a small line that's just either the raven saying nevermore or like him saying his soul shall be lifted nevermore. It always ends with the word nevermore. It's a very like um, structured. So it's uh, really easy to, to look at. It makes sense. Like it doesn't even necessarily rhyme in the first couple, couple lines. Um, by the way, if you missed it, a stanza is like a paragraph for poetry. I honestly don't know why it's named different, but a stanza is a paragraph. Um, and the first three lines don't end with a rhyme, but they do have that rhythm in there. And honestly, I'm too lazy to tell you what iambic it is or even if it's iambic, I'm too lazy to tell you the rhyme scheme. You honestly don't really need to know it. It was popular at the time and it's not popular now. <laughs> That's what I'm telling you, but I like old timey rhyme schemes and I like it when they do this motion, like then me thought the air grew denser. That's like iambic. So it's like then me thought. So it's like stress on stress. So yes. And then if you wanted to count the things you count how many stresses there are it's just it's a lot honestly I don't, I don't I don't deal with rhythm too much in poetry I don't usually worry too much about it because I don't put a lot of rhythm into my poetry because it doesn't really matter anymore I'm growing it I'm talking about poetry too much so anyway the raven from that like first experience with this me with me reading this to you do you have like a bit of an idea what it's about just to ask yourself like I personally believe that English is a lot about what you can tell from things. And it took me a long time being in college for me to realize that like English, you can never really be wrong. When you're in high school, you're told, oh, <laughs> when you're in high school, you're told that you're wrong all the time. And to be fair, you can be really wrong. If you're like, oh, like Emily Dickinson was a man, I think it's like, no, <laughs> she wasn't a man. <laughs> But if you think that maybe this song has like one of her poems is like lesbian undertones and you can like put aside a couple lines that like kind of prove it, like sure, why not? Like we're not the authors, all English 
people do is just wildly speculate, but they use like evidence for it. So wildly speculate. What do you think this poem is about? Now, I wildly speculated already, so <laughs> it's kind of a lot, but I'll tell you. Um, I think that people often don't understand also that literature has a couple different like layers, right? So there's the layer of what, what they're writing and what it's about. And then below that, there's a layer of like why the writer is writing this. And usually that top layer is what school talks about. And that bottom layer is kind of ignored sometimes, but like why the writer's writing this. And usually that has to do with like literary movements at the time. So usually reasons why Poe's writing this is because like he wants to talk about the Gothic. He wants to talk about the unknown, the supernatural, like the mystery and how terrifying it is and how like humans, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not going to give it away. So anyway, so let's talk about that first layer of what this poem is about, right? So that first layer. So let's go through and I'll explain it in normal human terms. <laughs> Basically, he's saying he's sitting there in his like house. He's dreaming. He's taking a nap and someone knocks at the door and then no one is there. And he thinks it might be his lost Lenore, who we see is like a woman, probably because she's a maiden um, and probably his love. So like a wife or a girlfriend of some kind. And she's dead now. So she died and like there's a bunch of things that the raven slash this emptiness could be. I'm kind of gonna lump them together. So, but anyway, he hears something at the door. He answers the door and no one's there. He's like, is it you, Lenore? And no one answers. So he goes to sit back down and then he hears something at the window. And so he opens the window and a bird comes flying in, a raven. And it lands on this like bust of Pallas. And honestly, I forget who Pallas is. I forget who it is. Let me, let me Google it. Let's see who Pallas is. Pallas. Okay, all right, okay. Seems like he was a Greek person. So, <laughs> let's see. Pallas. Ooh, Greek mythology. The son of the Titans, Creus and Eurioba. The father of Zeus and Nike, Kratos and Ea. So he was a Titan. That's really interesting. Cool, let's try again. So I've returned and I've Googled who Pallas is. He was a Titan. Um, so if you know who like the Roman gods are, the Roman gods had parents and the parents were called Titans and Titans like include Kronos and all that, but it also includes a Titan called Pallas. Can you guys hear my cat? She is so mad at me <laughs> for locking her out of here. She was meowing in the background if you couldn't hear it. But anyway, anywho, Pallas is a Titan. Um, and in general, there's not too much information about him other than that he's a Titan and the Titans are all dead. So I guess that's important. And also, they usually don't put it in there unless it's important. So anyway, um, the raven comes in. It sits on this bust of this Titan above his door. And Edgar Allan Poe, or the main character here, asks the raven, he's like, okay, are you... Sorry, I heard a sound and it spooked me. Um, sorry. So the raven sits there and he asks what the raven's name is and the raven says, nevermore. Now, ignoring the fact that the raven can speak. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna pretend like this is completely normal um, that a raven can talk right now um, because his next thing is to be like what a strange raven who says that his name is nevermore um, so again he's like well this bird's here and that word like clearly is the only thing that like an outpoured emotion right it must be an important word and then um He's saying that like, 
He asks the raven basically about grief and death and the unknown. He does it in a bunch of different questions and over the course of it, he kind of gets comforted but also not comforted by the raven because every time he asks a question, the raven only says never more. So his first question is like, let's see here, it says, he says, other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me as my hopes have flown before. I'm assuming that means that like he is italicized here. I'm assuming that that means that that like grief will leave him as his hopes have left him in the past, that, that this will happen. You know, like he'll get over it is kind of what he's saying. And the bird says nevermore, that he, this dude is not gonna leave you. This dude meaning like grief, death, he's never gonna stop hanging around which is super bummer. <laughs> and he's like shocked by this answer from the raven. Like they're having a conversation. Like he didn't know the raven would say that back. And he's like, okay, well, like you only say one word and you must be like really unhappy and, and bad. And you're gonna, you're gonna say this again. And your song is not that important. And like, he says, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore. That's an interesting thing to say. Till the dirges, first of all, dirge, a funeral dirge is not like a good song. So the dirges of his hope, that melancholy burden bore. What an interesting phrase. It's kind of like saying like hope is a burden that he melancholy is like trying to keep up with right now. And he's like, it's gonna be fine. Like I can keep up with it. And the raven's like, nevermore. <laughs> Um, and he just keeps going back and forth with this raven, you know, and um, he's, he takes out this little cushion and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to wave this in front of the bird because that makes sense. And the bird's just like, nevermore. And then he's just saying like, he realizes too that he's holding this cushion and Lenore is never going to sit on this cushion again. And he's like, ah, nevermore. The bird doesn't say it in that stanza. And in the next stanza, he said, Methought the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on a tufted floor. First of all, seraphim are angels, in case anyone did not know. They are the top angels. So, like, in case anyone doesn't know this, angels have like like layers, like they're like a corporation, and there's like bosses, and then there's like receptionists. <laughs> <laughs> like the bosses, like the head honchos are the seraphim. And I've actually looked into this before. It's really interesting. The seraphim are like quoted to have like more than one pair of wings. So they have wings on their backs, but some of them are quoted as having wings on their faces, which is kind of strange. But he's saying here that he's like f smelling the perfumery of the seraphim, which is really strange. And he's saying he's hearing them walk by. And he cries out to the bird. He says, wretch. Thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe and forget this lost Lenore. So he smells the, the like angel incense basically, and he thinks that this bird came from God to distract him and help him forget about Lenore and her death and like get over her. And then, he, and then the, the raven says, obviously, nevermore. He's like, no. That's not what I'm here for. And then he completely turns. It's hilarious. In the next stanza, I actually think this poem was kind of funny. <laughs> I, it's probably not supposed to be funny, but I think it's a little funny because this man is like clearly losing his mind. And he's like yelling at a raven who's only saying one thing to him and is like so shocked every time the raven says nevermore. It's actually kind of funny. Um, so the raven, excuse me, the raven says nevermore. And he goes, ah, prophet, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil. So now he's like, okay, well, are you a prophet or are you a devil? By that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden who's the, whom the angels name Lenore. So he's saying, you know, like, tell me whether you're an angel or a devil, like, will I ever hold Lenore's hand again? Will I see her in heaven at some point? And the raven says, nevermore, which is the darkest part of this poem. <laughs> it's real dark. He's kind of like being comforted and having a conversation up until this point when the raven like dashes all his hopes and tells him like his worst fear is coming true. <laughs> it's like, nah, when you die, you'll never see her again. What a bummer. 
is not very nice of this bird. <laughs> this is, I kind of think this poem's a little funny. It's a raven talking, but it's fine. Anyway. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend. I shrieked up starting. I really like the, the rhyme in there. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's Plutonian shore. Now, night's Plutonian is capitalized. I don't actually know what night's Plutonian means. I kind of forgot that was in this poem. I promise I did research before this, but I'm bad at illusions. So in case you don't know, um, an illusion with an A. It's not an illusion. I'm not a magician. An illusion with an A is a reference to like another work of art within something. So if you're reading a book and it talks about a book, it's, talk it's making an illusion. Now that's different from an epigraph where like a chapter starts with like a quote. That's called an epigraph. That's different. Um, but to say nice Plutonian shore and it's capitalized, it must be like some sort of reference to something. And let's see. Plutonian is reference to Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld. Oh, okay, that makes sense. The narrator, upon first encountering the raven, is amused by its stately comportment. So this is what I was talking about. He's like, oh, you're here to amuse me. Like, maybe forget, forget about Lenore. And he's having this conversation with this raven. And then the raven's like, ah, you'll never be happy again. And he's like, what? And he kind of gets upset by it. And he says that, like from Knight's Plutonian shore must mean that like this raven is like a messenger from the realm of like death. Like you were sent from like hell itself. <laughs> like, why don't you go back to hell itself? Cause I don't want you here anymore. <laughs> and so he's saying, just leave, like quit the bust above my door, just like go home. And the raven's like, never more, which is like super haunting. And the raven is still sitting above his door and it, that raven, he says, the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. So he's saying that this shadow is like the shadow of the raven is holding his own soul down for like as long as the raven sits there. I think this is super interesting. First of all, in terms of the gothic, the raven could mean so many things. So if you're just thinking in terms of like Gothic and romanticism, romanticism itself was about like nature and like the self and the Gothic takes it like in a spooky term, spooky turn. So if this is Gothic related, you know, we're talking about like the bird could represent death, could represent the supernatural, could represent the unknown. I think that's a really good one because the bird doesn't really respond to anything that Poe is saying. He, he's just, all the bird is saying is nothing. He's saying the word nevermore, which is really similar to the word nothing and how we use it. You know, he's saying never again, nothing more. Like it, it's, it's very like void. <laughs> so I could see the bird is representing the unknown, what our narrator doesn't know, what he's scared of, um, and also just literally being deaf. If you wanted to look at this from like a modern perspective, which I like to do sometimes, like put modern perspectives onto like older poems and like see if that brings up anything, um, I could see this raven as reflecting like depression as well. Like back then, I don't think they really understood what depression was, but to imagine your own sadness and grief as a raven who greets you and at first you're kind of amused by it and you think it's fleeting and then you realize it's there for longer and you kind of can't ever leave it or get out from under it. That seems very like related to depression to me. So like, while well, maybe Poe didn't like have the DSM-5 like out in front of him and was like, wow, let's, <laughs> let's look at the symptoms and write a poem about depression. I don't think that was his purpose. I do think it works on that level though, which is really interesting. Pause. Pause, pause, pause. Let me look down at my notes. Yes, curiosity. Yeah, and this keeps going further too. So the Gothic and like, I feel like the Gothic was like sort of a, a especially Poe was really into like the, the almost mental illness side of the Gothic. I feel like um, a lot of the time back then the Gothic was just ghost stories. Poe really dove into like madman crazy things, <laughs> which 
which is super spooky and why I did not like to read them when I was younger because I don't like to read stories of a man losing his mind thinking he can still hear the heart of the man he murdered. So he really dives into that. Um, and Poe's other work as well. I have my notes out from my like old American literature classes and some of Poe's other work talks about how the unknown that the Gothic sometimes raises up. So this is also different. Poe did this differently. Sometimes Gothic stories from back in the day says, ah, oh, the unknown, it's so spooky and fun. Poe takes it much more seriously. He says the unknown is very scary. We should not walk into it. It's bad for us, just like how urban environments are bad for us and how like all of this is bad for us. <laughs> it's like if anxiety was like a literature, <laughs> that's what Poe's like gothic prose is about. Um, and other cool stuff about this poem. So I find it really interesting. So I chose this poem because first of all, it's also science fiction-y, right? Maybe you haven't gotten there yet, but it's science fiction-y um, in the terms that Poe was considered to be one of the fathers of science fiction, along with like H.G. Wells and um, Veres, is that his name? I don't read a lot of him. Um, I just know H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, a lot better. But they took their inspiration from Poe stuff. Like Poe was one of the first ones to do science fiction. It's, le it's some of his lesser known work, but some of it is still very science fiction-y. Even this is kind of science fiction-y because it's all about like, he talked a lot about the urban environment and how it was bad for you and how like technology was bad for you and like science, like it was in reaction to the enlightenment, which was all about science. So while the technology and science was different back then, he still wrote about it. And one of his works too, I'm sorry, I forget the name of it, was sort of like a to the moon type of story, which is really interesting because that's kind of where science fiction like really started and you know, like War of the Worlds, like aliens and stuff like that. So Poe was one of like the fathers of science fiction, which is why I thought it would be fun to talk about one of the fathers of science fiction, lesser known, and to talk about his super famous poem, The Raven. And also because I love talking about the Gothic and romanticism, I love literary movements, especially American literary movements. You would think that that's what I studied. I didn't. <laughs> I did study that because I'm an English major, but I focus on modernism, which is like Catcher in the Rye. It's not Gothic and Romanticism. I just also like the Gothic and Romanticism. And um, another cool fact I was thinking of while I was doing this was because um, I was like, oh wow, the father of science fiction, I should read something by Poe. And Poe has a ton of work, but not a ton of novels. He has lots of short stories, lots of poems. He did, he did so much. But his, po his novels, like, they're not really, meh. so, like, they're lesser known, and, like, I don't even really know how many he has. It's just that, like, because I knew I wanted to do The Raven, so I wasn't, like, doing a ton of research about every single thing that Poe has ever done. It would be endless. He was so prolific. But novels were not really a thing back then. Have I mentioned this on the podcast before? If I have, I'm sorry. I think this is, like, the coolest fact. So back in the day, it was like really salacious to read novels. They were considered like a lowbrow form of like literature. Like novels themselves are usually like fiction and they usually like stories. And at this time during like Poe's world, it was very like gothic and romantic, right? And at this time, it was considered kind of trashy to read any novel. So if you wanted to read Northanger Abbey by <clears throat> Jane Austen, it would be considered trashy. It was trashy back then for girls, especially to read it. Back then, you could read short stories, you could read autobiographies, but like the novel was very like, ooh, oh no. And you know why? It was because sexism. It was, um, <laughs> it was considered to be that women's like what is it? What is it? What's the old timey word for like composure? I guess. I don't know. Women's like compositions were like too fragile to deal with like these fiction stories and that their like minds would like get too into it and they start like imagining stuff like they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between real world and these books. That's literally what people thought. They were like, oh no, you're reading novels? Like, but now every time you open a closet, you're gonna think there's a skeleton in there because you can't tell the difference. Like that's literally what people thought. And um, 
I was mentioning Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen because she actually jokes about that in that book. I would love to cover it on the podcast in the future. I'm probably gonna talk about it because I like that book a lot because it's funny. But in Northanger Abbey, the female protagonist reads novels and because she reads novels, she suspects her like the, the man of the manor she's staying in to be a murderer based on almost nothing. And she tends to assume that stuff's gonna be like really dramatic and she's gonna find skeletons or someone's gonna slap someone because she reads novels. And so Jane Austen kind of pokes fun at that belief because back then people actually believed that. So she was like poking fun at it. So, so Poe did not do a ton of novels. I don't know if that was a personal choice or if, if it was a reflection of the time, but he wrote a, a ton of short stories and a ton of poetry that have lived on a lot. And we think of Poe as a big old weirdo now. <laughs> um, but I really like The Raven. It's probably my favorite work by him in terms of it being like well-written and striking. I would say his other work is also my favorite in that it spooks me from what I've read. So like, it's very effective. And um, something I read also said that Poe's like use of science fiction works because as, an, as a writer, he's able to suspend your disbelief for kind of a long while. So like you're, he's able to be like, oh no, this is normal. And you kind of don't even realize it because the protagonist accepts it as normal. So he's really good at doing that. And it led to him writing crazy stories that people really enjoyed because they didn't feel the need to like poke holes into it. So it's just really interesting. I just really like it. I thought we'd talk about the father of science fiction and trashy novels and <laughs> and ravens and iambic pentameter. I honestly don't know if this is pentameter or not. I'm sorry, you guys, I love you. I'm not gonna count how many stresses there are in each sentence for you. I just don't feel like doing it. It's not that important. <laughs> Um, so I just thought this would be a fun episode. I love talking about tiny poems. Not that this is tiny, but now you kind of know what it means. I think that a lot of people talk about the raven and I tend to think about that quote, like how is a raven like a writing desk? And then my brain connects it to Edward, Edward, Edgar Allan Poe because he wrote the poem, The Raven. And then I'm like, how is that poem like a writing desk? And I'm like, that's clearly not what the Mad Hatter was asking me. <laughs> Um, and I also thought about um, talking about the Jabberwocky. I wasn't sure which one I wanted to do. The Jabberwocky is the intro poem to Alice, Alice in Wonderland. And it's a really interesting, weird madman poem. It doesn't make any sense. It's about the slaying of like this monster slash dragon called the Jabberwocky. And I thought we'd talk about that or the Raven. And I chose the Raven because science fiction, because he was the father of it. And he's considered to be like the creator, like, I, which is crazy. Cause I like have never really even really heard that before. Like he's like the hidden creator of it. Like apparently HG Wells and all these people like really kind of just made fanfics of his works for a while. And they were like toted as being like the creators of science fiction. And they were just really big Poe fans. So it's really fun to think of him as the actual originator. H.G. Wells and like all of these cool people, there's like the Hugo Award, everything's like named after them. And it's like, what? No, Poe did stuff. <laughs> so I kind of feel bad for Poe from a modern perspective too, because he wrote all this stuff and he was like virtually penniless. He like barely squeaked by and he was a huge deal in his lifetime. He was a big deal. He knew he was a big deal and he didn't make like any money from like anything he did. So it's, it's strange to read his work because he really, he did so good and he wrote so often and he didn't get like any money from it. I'm glad that writers nowadays <laughs> can actually take money from their work. There's a ton more analysis to be done on The Raven. The Raven is, is endless. It can, just, it can just keep going and going and going. We could discuss if you wanted, whether this is a hallucination or all a dream, or if this is like actually happening, if Poe is, insinuating that this is actually happening, that a raven landed on his door and said never more, or if it's a little of both. I would think that he's awake, but he's maybe losing his mind. That would be my guess. Because he said he woke up from a nap and like, it would be spooky, but what well, I don't know though. Like it's just whatever you guess. So it's pretty cool. I mean, it's about grief. It's about lost love. It's about like depression and death and the unknown and how like we're never gonna escape that. It's a super big bummer, but it's also kind of funny because a man's talking to a raven. So I'm gonna leave you with that. This is kind of a shorter episode. 
Um, oh, but I have some announcements. So let's do some announcements as well. <laughs> um, some announcements. Okay, so I have some awesome stuff happening for Bad Book Club. I have created a Patreon. It is live. You can subscribe to it. The Patreon has some fun quirks and, and like perks right now, and I'm adding more. So um, I want to make sure I can do it all before I add more, but I have all these ideas to add more on to it right now. You can be a friend, which is for about the price of a cup of coffee a month, and you'll get book and movie recommendations for each episode that I put out. So for example, after The Raven is out, I'll send out book and movie recommendations that are similar to The Raven if you want to feel inspired, which could be super fun. Nerds get episodes early starting in April. March was a little crazy, so I said starting in April. You'll start getting episodes a couple days early. And if you're a lovely, you get like monthly Ask Me Anythings and you also get like a cool loyalty program of merch. So you'll start with a sticker and then you'll get like a print and then you'll get like a mug and you'll get a t-shirt if you're with it, if you're with that lovely program for a year as a thank you. What else, what else? Um, anyone who leaves a review, I would be happy to call you out and tell you thank you for your review. Um, I would greatly appreciate it if you left a review on there today and if you hit subscribe and if you tell a friend about Bad Book Club. I love talking to you guys and this podcast is created, written, studied, <laughs> what a, produced and edited by just little old me. So any support is welcome and appreciated. If you could follow us on all of our social media at Bad Book Club Pod, I give like updates and life updates and pictures of my cats. It's thrilling, just thrilling. And also on our Instagram, I posted this little promo of season two that has some of the titles that we'll be looking at this season. So you can check that out if you want to have a sneak peek of what you could look up, will look forward to. That's the phrase. Um, lastly, if you want to buy any of the books that I talk about on this podcast and also support a local bookstore at the same time, you can use my link below and support a local bookstore and buy the book and also support me, Bad Book Club, the podcast, Jade. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you aren't talking to a raven who's depressing you and that there's no raven sitting on your bust of Pallas because Pallas the Titan doesn't deserve that. And I'll see you next um, next time for a regular book review and analysis with my lovelies. Don't forget to review and subscribe. I'll love you guys forever. Bye.